um, Google. <laughs> yes, yeah, when Google say. tells you about the archaeology news. <laughs> oh, oh yes, that's where I usually find all my news, isn't it? Oh. Yes. I've been too busy. I've been, I've been here in um, St. David's. Oh, uh, yes, I forgot it. How going, is that? Oh, it's great. I'm just um, getting off the settee. We're in this nice little cottage. And, um, oh, lovely. I can't get my laptop to work, so I'm using the phone. So that's why it's a little different. <laughs> it's okay. It looks like you're having a yeah. lovely time. It looks beautiful there. Yeah, oh, it's a lovely place. You know, it's got all sorts of nice stuff and upstairs. Oh, wow. Story. Pretty old cottage, you know. So uh, oh. it's. Uh, wow. It's really nice. Yes, I've been here. We're only here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. So I will be with you on Thursday. Okay, that's so, fine, Patty. You can tell us all about it. It seems absolutely gorgeous. Um, <laughs> definitely uh, live in a, a nice uh, week then in a lovely uh, cottage. Um, yes. I've had Google listen to me this week. Um, Google has put up on my news feed about DJ, um, DJ details <laughs> of a rare Bronze Age coffin found in a golf course pond. Um, it's been revealed. Uh, quite recently is thought to be 4,000 years old um, and it's the size of a telephone box. Um, it's really well preserved um, due to waterlog and the, there's an axe among the remains and um, so they're starting to piece together who this individual could be. Um, this was uh, in Lincolnshire as well so when they were putting through uh, some bits and bobs into the golf um, course and this is when they start to find this appearing and it was Historic England on Friday that re released the details of this discovery and how this has been going on since 2018 and it's only now that they start to talk about it. Um, this coffin <laughs> is, 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 from, uh, is a log coffin, it's about three metres long by one metre and it he was an individual, he was a man who was buried here, so a lot of people are questioning whether he was a, a warrior or someone of high status. Um, and th there was a gravel mound raised over the grave, so you can see a lot of practices as well that they've said um, in terms of this grave for the time period as well. And it seems to be a, a very fantastic discovery, so it'd be nice, nice to see more coming out about this rather than just announcing the discovery um, because sometimes they can only give you so much information. I do like the news stories where they basically give you anything and everything without actually looking for the academic sources but it seems very interesting to uh, read that they're still finding things and it just makes me smile because I used to panic as a child. It's a really silly worry that everything would be discovered by the time I was an adult. So uh, it's nice that we know that this isn't the case. Um, I think next week I just want to say that we'll be looking at medieval Italy um, and just the finds that they've had there. Um, been reading a very good article on that and uh, a settlement and just looking at all the uh, artefacts as well that they've uh, managed to find and how that tells you about um, the Lombards um, so you get some fantastic images if I can get this up on the screen like these ones here um, which we'll go into great detail but I think it'd be nice to re relate that to uh, some seals as well from the medieval period how we can tell um, this to be the Lombards and if there's uh, any relation to the laws because you do find some evidence of seals being found here which I'll get into uh, next lesson but this lesson I've decided to do um, medieval settlements we have done one before and um, but this one's another um, little twist to it so we are doing um, some sites uh, some that you know of such as Trelec we'll be looking a little bit at that um, and we'll be going to one in Spain. So we'll be doing a, a nice variety, I think, of settlements and what that can tell us. Um, one of them is going to be somewhere that we went when we went on our York trip quite recently. So this is Cotton. I normally talk about Warren Percy, which is uh, near York as well. But I feel like I've talked a little bit too much about this uh, settlement and maybe uh, save it for another time. 
So I'll uh, share screen now um, and we'll get stuck into it. Um, and hopefully Anne and Peter turn up when they're, when, they're, when they're able to get here. Anyway, so if I... Uh, play from the beginning. Hurrah, it's working. My laptop has been a little bit funny the, earlier this morning. I was panicking. I was thinking, oh, gosh, not today. I don't think I could deal with it today. So uh, if I get my notes up quickly and then we'll uh, get into it. Um, the joys of Google Docs, they tend to uh, close itself by the time you want to get onto it. So uh, just click on that one here. Perfect. Anyway, so um, we'll be getting into... Uh, a discussion about medieval settlements, um, how each of them vary in the way that they've been uh, protected, in the way that they've been analysed, and the excavations that we see with them. So we'll be looking at quite a few um, medieval settlements, some of them ranging from Wales to Spain to England, and hopefully I aim to actually look at places such as um, possibly other places such as Ireland and Italy as time goes on, but we will be looking at Italy next week. Um, and I think it's, it's, nice, it's a nice introduction sometimes to actually look at settlements because it can give you so much more information. So um, just looking at settlements and how they act and how they're connected with other settlements and then look at the broader picture, you can find out so much information about superstitions, about... Um, everyday life about trade so there is a lot that goes on with um, medieval villages that you can get a lot of information from and I think lost medieval villages their settlements they have taken the academic world by storm for many years and looking at a village can allow people to feel more connected with the archaeology it can allow them to have some tangible evidence to actually touch and feel connected to uh, when we went to Cornwall we looked at um, Hound Tor or Hunter Tor in the Doomsday Book um, which is known as um, and that was just nice to actually touch and feel and feel connected to the archaeology and how this is able to tell us about the connections and his livelihoods and the people who've lived there and the settlements can provide strong evidence into how life was for the ordinary person in the medieval period and what we can understand about them and who was in control and what their houses look like and their style of architecture I know uh, I've talked about turf housing before um, and what that means it, it can show that there's an influence from many different civilizations around the world so um, we go to this village here. I think I have briefly touched upon this village beforehand. So um, I know that some of you might be a little bit familiar with this. So if I just get onto the thing of my notes. So uh, there is on that slide here. So um, this village is... Uh, a very interesting one when you uh, actually read into it, you start to realise that there's a, a village that was uh, missing and people were able to actually connect it further. This was something that was in Glasgow, Scotland, and um, this was just due to um, a road being built. They discovered this village and they had indications beforehand that the, this village had um, been present, um, but they just were looking for the evidence for it. And there was a castle, an 11th century religious monument known to be in this area, which hence to this settlement placement, like I have said. And it was found really by chance because there wasn't an excavation seeking it out. It was an improvement of motorways that had found this. And this, this pushed... Um, archaeology to actually be funded to actually look at these remains of four medieval houses that discovered that was discovered along with pottery and gaming pieces and other objects that were found and these remind, uh, remains survived literally on the edge of an existing hard shoulder of the M M74 um, 
And I think the fact that we're seeing cost free and gaming pieces here, we're seeing how this is an area with wealth. We're seeing how this is an area where you can see the social life, how um, people are actually interacting with each other, their, their leisure time. And there's a cross in the area that was thought to be evidence of the worship as a community and not a church, which is uh, something that we see with early Christianity um, um, yew trees and uh, also crosses they're useful in people that, to, to get people to gather rather than being in a church a church can be quite hierarchical uh, you know a lot of hierarchy in there and can actually separate people but actually having um, a cross outside can allow people to gather and be at one while they listen but there's a lot of discussion in terms of that but when we look at the findings we find that there was a quite a few um, artifacts that were quite interesting when they were looking and of course like I said they found four stone buildings and the radiocarbon dates of the village was uh, thought to be from um, the beginning of the 14th century um, right up to the end of the 17th century so we see evidence of this um, cross being earlier then there could be suggestion that there was this there was a settlement before this, um, but it is now somehow lost. Um, and I think this is something, even though we have a lot of information of, um, it's still making scientific scientists and archaeologists scratch their heads because there's something being told to us. It's just we're not really sure what entirely and um, so it's nice to sometimes get some outside the knowledge um or an outside perspective on this to see if there's anything that they're missing but there was a dagger that was found in the soil um again people were saying was this something to do with uh, food was this something to do with craftsmanship or status but it was thought to be evidence of protection um some people just thought that this was just part of defence of having someone there to protect them from anyone outside. Some people, like I said, thought that it was just using, but uh, used for preparing food, which is something that we can always uh, understand. Because sometimes um, I think archaeologists take on a very long-winded um, explanation of what something could be, but it could just simply just be for food. And there's evidence of craftsmanship. With this settlement, there is um, archaeological evidence that they found of iron smelting and blacksmith works, which is showing that they had a very advanced um, industry and this could be evidence of trade further going on. Um, and the reason why it's so wealthy because of all of this, um, these glass gaming pieces that they talk about, um, Last time that I could think of something that was so detailed like that was Lindisfarne. Um, there's a dig going on in Lindisfarne at the moment. It's called um, Dig Adventures. And they've been doing a lot of work there. It's been on the news. Um, and they found some amazing artefacts. And it's something that I've talked on my first day classes. But this glass gaming piece just was absolutely fantastic and if this is anything like the one that they found in the village of Neveron then I can only only actually speculate this to be a very wealthy um, village and you can see how there's pottery here from jugs and cooking pots jars and bowls and um, they haven't been able to determine where this pottery is coming from um, but it'd be quite interesting to see where it came from, because then we can further see connections and trade links with other areas. And it can also help us date the area more specifically as well. Um, there was nails and other little parts of the settlement. That, so it's common, you'd see it. The, I'm sure... If you had a look on your street somewhere, there would probably be a, a nail hidden somewhere underneath the ground. The nails fall over the place anyway. But there was a very unusual dis uh, deposit of uh, artefacts within his foundations in uh, one of the buildings because it was shown pottery, pieces of pottery and a collection of objects that were not found elsewhere on the site. This included um, a fine-grained sandstone, um, a spindle wall, 
um, made of uh, can, canal coal, a gaming piece, like I said, a counter of uh, green glazed pottery, and two 17th century coins. Now, in this time period, I think you see a lot of green glazed pottery. Um, a lot of people are saying it's ham green inspired. Um, you see it being made in Ireland, Wexford. Um, you see it being made in Wales. Um, it's a pottery, I think, that is just taken on by storm. And I don't think it was solely Bristol that inspired the whole of Britain to have green pottery. I think it was definitely due to trade connections. And so the only way that I could explain this is thinking of um, when something is a trend and loads of people jump onto it. Um, oh, I can't pick off to the top of my head because there's so many different trends. Um, maybe... The, the only thing I could think of is my sisters. They had these big bow things. Everyone was wearing them. And then before you know it, different companies were making their own versions of the bows, but they had the same sort of characteristics. That's the only way that I could have imagined doing it is there's more um, movement of people, more connections and links. There's more ideas being spread. And so you have this idea of green glazed pottery. Everyone likes that. And I think... You see green glazed pottery in places where there's a lot of wealth, especially if they have very detailed um, pieces on there, such as uh, faces or even like the one we see in Cardiff, where there's stick people holding hands. Um, you definitely see how this is something that is decorative. And so um, to me, this suggests this to be a very wealthy village. Um, and just a, a sharing of ideas. But what we have on the screen here is the iron dagger that was found. And this was something that was just um, nine da dagger that was found along with all this green glazed pottery that wasn't found anywhere else on the site with this counter with the spin wall. I just think that this house was possibly the house that had the most riches in there, maybe a high status individual that was living there. Um, and this dagger was there, why people thought that this was for protection because all these high status um, artifacts were being held in this building. Um, and this was um, buried, this dagger, um, it's thought that this dagger is from Iron Age, so people seem to think that there was a superstition going on here where they found this Iron Age um, dagger and they buried it under the house that had all the expensive um, items in there. And so this provided provided prote protection for a superstition. Um, and some people just say this was just something that was used for foods in the Iron Age and it was just lost and they just happened to put the settlement on top. Um, a lot of people talk about this, um, still not something that they've pinpointed on. But um, you can see how th these special objects, um, it, like, like I said, I don't think it was just to protect um, this one house. I think it was to protect the whole village. Um, it seems that there's a very spiritual um, aspect to this town is also um, a very religious aspect in terms of Christianity in this town so um, especially where it is in Glasgow you can probably guess that maybe this is an area where they're slowly um, developing different to the rest of Britain and something that's maybe a little bit more open. Um, so we get to this site here um, again it's always building roads I think that you start to find these uh, medieval villages I know that the building actually of HS2 is found um, an Anglo-Saxon church. So th th it's quite actually fascinating um, to see how these sorts of things happen. Um, and they just by accident and they have to do this rescue archaeology really into uh ensuring that they've got all the information that's not lost. So this is something that was in 2021, so this is quite a recent thing that I thought I'd uh, 
bring to everyone's attention, keep an eye out for, see if there's any information out in the future. But it's for to date from the 14th century to the 17th century. So like the last settlement, really, it seems like um, this is a very high time for villages to set off. And I think part of the reason for that is that you have the Black Death and um, something that people seem to think is that um, this brought a decline in a lot of pop- in a lot of the population, and after that, the population started going up, and more specialities were brought forward. Um, again, this is something that brought forward artifacts such as a dagger, and um, something that has a different um, interpretation. They just think this is evidence of everyday life, and as you can see in this excavation that they have here, um, they show a wall pointing out here. Um, they've got another wall pointing out there um, and another wall there. They, they, they're working hard and they're really trying their hardest next to this really busy walk road. I can imagine how um, intimidating that could be because someone could just literally swerve over. You can see how they're working on this to try and get all the information. And from what I could gather, um, if I could get the pen out again, um, from my angle, it looks like... Um, from the notes that I had is that they have um, something like this going across. So when they finished to get it up, that was when they were able to find that there was walls that were going out like this, um, which is quite unusual. I think it just shows that this is a bigger build than was fought. Um, this excavation was allowing archaeologists to come closer to um the past and what it was like and I think one thing I like about the fact that them stumbling across things quite by accident is that it it makes the archaeology happen it makes archaeologists look at this rather than actually trying to find funding for something that people don't want to fund but when it's found by accident there seems to be a lot of things working on it um and this is something that's fantastic because it's not far from the edge of the road. So you can imagine how much of a miss this was if it, it was sealed by the road. Um, and there's thought to be four medieval houses that have been found um, in this area and evidence of this being a very small settlement. And this is something that was absolutely fantastic because people were actually connecting this with the Neverton um, buildings as well and how they were able to find out that this was an area that they were yielding lots of information and able to uh, get an understanding what a lost medieval village was like. So um, I'll take us now to northern Spain because I thought we, we have to go somewhere a little bit different. It's always in Britain that I do so I thought if I could take you away with me to somewhere else. And this is a medieval village that was found in northern Spain. And this is village, uh, the village of um, Argonza. So that was brought to light um, in Spain. And it was through a series of excavations, tombs, houses and silos from the Middle Ages. They were able to get an idea of what this was like from, again, all the way through the medieval period right till the 17th century. And it was a team of archaeologists from um, quite a few organisations. One was the Heritage and Cultural Landscapes of the University of Pius Vasco um, that discovered this medieval village. And it had a, um, a Franciscan convent as well in the river valley near the town so there was a lot of significance to this area and when they were looking at this uh, village they saw that there was a large amount of buildings here that was able to tell them a lot of interesting um, details of what it was like and I think it's definitely different to what how we see excavations being done in Britain um, you always just see the houses I think sometimes you see bodies but this one you're able to see these bodies and they're very well preserved as well and um, they were able to find a, a large rectangular tower there the tower walls were about 6.6 feet uh, it, wide and the height was around about 9.8 feet and there was a residential building carved out of stone blocks here that was discovered on the site 
um, which is actually disco- uh, discussed on the uh, government website that they have when they talk about tourism. So the excavations, I think, pinpointed a large cemetery with tombs and graves enclosed by stone slabs. And they were able to date these individuals um, before the year 1000 um, AD. So it showed that this cemetery contains both children, adults, young and old. And one thing that I always say is that we know that there is a normal burial when we have everyone from society represented in this. If it's just men, then you seem to think that this is possibly a massacre, um, or if it was just women, or if it was just one age group. There's lots of age groups, um, both genders, all mixed into this, uh, this cemetery. And so this suggested to archaeologists that the, a community was buried here and they were able to identify some houses close to the cemetery, which were using, uh, being used in the medi- medieval period. And they were built on stone and they were enclosed with short lived materials. So it was interesting to find how um, they were able to store grain as well. So this is uh, one of the silos they had to store grain here um, and this is what they were able to find so they're not just finding um the cemetery they're not just finding where they live they found where they were able to store food and i think that's something that we could actually see as trade goods as well maybe look for connections through that as well um, the archaeology is here is fantastic. You see that this was a very strong village. And I think that if it's a strong village, then we're going to have evidence of trade, um, more or less, and it's something that they need to look into. And um, in 1615, the Franciscan uh, Covenant of um, Our Lady of Conception was founded in the old church of Santa Maria. And these are excavations that recover a plan of a monastery and um, a church and a garden and other buildings. And they found numerous burials in this area as well. And it was interesting because these graves contained a skeleton with a bone rosary around the neck. And you even see some pottery vessels here such as food dishes that have been recovered from the monastery so the monastery nearby i think was evidence of why this um village was strong and we do see that in wales as well how the monastery can sometimes spur on trade and uh, allow a, um, a village to prosper to actually grow and it, there's evidence of living and dead here, how they lived and how they died. So it was very interesting to actually read all of this, especially seeing it from another country. And Spain is a country that actually really loves his archaeology. So you see how this is all well preserved and something that they're really proud of and can't wait to tell people about, um, which is something that we don't really see. And they believe that this was, um, they had the first ever written references of this village from around um, the 6th century to the 8th century, but it was the year um, 801 where um, Balatala um, de las Contras de Arganzon um, took place around the village. This is a battle of um, the Christian uh, contingent that was am- ambushed by Arab forces during the raids of um, Avila and Castile. And you you see how this is something that's being documented in terms of uh, 871. There's another document that mentions the church and how this um, was given to a noble as inheritance. Um, So he owned that monastery, and I think it just shows who were actually controlling the area and how we do have elites interacting with this as well. But it was thought that after 871, when this was um, handed over as inheritance, um, it was repopulated by people from that area. So it was something they came back after the battle. And these, these towns were a very different process from whatever towns were of the time they basically see that this result of repopulation in northern spain in the ninth century was a a part of local initiative 
and they felt like this was a town that they allowed them to develop and grow and so this was something that they should go back to um and I think that the battle obviously showed the decline in the town but was something that they definitely felt like they could pick up afterwards but the fact that we can see evidence of the grain here and the bodies and the fact that one of them has a rosary around their neck it just shows how strong the religion is to the people there but also how the livelihood is there as well in terms of grains and how this would further tell us about possible trade or even diet of the individuals <laughs> at, this, um, at this town but there is um, a tower this um part of a castle that's there as well so I think it just shows that if there's a castle there is going to be more connections and so there is going to be a village or a settlement nearby that's going to uh to actually benefit from this so um we get to uh this one here which is a, a more recent one and what you see on the top right hand corner is um this is evidence of open field systems they were able to find in Anglesey and this this town was able to be found at first in terms of looking at a, a it was um a coffin that was found here in the 1870s and this led to the interest of the site in 2016 and it was thought that this is a 7th century settlement, but it was the coffin that was quite interesting because it was dated earlier by the 4th or the 5th century. It's now kept in Bangor Museum, if any of you are interested to actually have a little nose at that um, and just see what that's all about, um, because it does sound absolutely fantastic. But it was this coffin here that actually um, spurred on... Um, excavations and you do see that there's evidence um, of people taking an interest throughout time I think that's something that we see with history um, that people want to document their past and what they had seen and I've, I've, I like people who do that because you definitely end, understand what's going on so it was in Anglesey that they found all of this and it was the Glamorgan Gwent Archaeological Trust that further pushed for there to be um, excavations on the site and they were able to take imagery like the one that we see on the right hand side and see that there was open field systems here, not as clear as Rossilly, um, but clear enough to, for us to see that there was... Um, Definitely some sort of uh, farming, mixed farming going on here and something that people really felt like um, was important to actually document. And this was a first for Wales because this was a, a medieval village. I don't think it is a first. When you read the media, they always say it's the first. Um, and they say that in 2016, this was a first because it was the yeah, first ever piece of evidence of early medieval um, villages being found. And uh, you can agree, but at the same time, you have places like Longbury Bank, you have um, places like Dennis Power, so you can see evidence um, in lots of places down South Wales. So I think it's not a first for, a, for Wales, but I think it's a first for... Um, the area to find something like this um, and this field system was shown to be a town that was based around farming mixed farming and so they thought that this was obvious reason as to why the vikings were later um able to uh, attract vikings because of trade this was something that we see trade with the vikings in terms of slavery and something that we see with connections with um, the rest of Wales and Ireland. Um, but it, it seems that this is, um, by our expert standards, as a landmark discovery. It's thought to be built during the first few hundred years after the Romans had fled Britain as well. And it was this village that was really taken an interest by um, archaeologists, and they were able to find seven buildings here. And it's the bottom image um, at the bottom where you can see this. Um, so if I get the pen out, um, you can see one room. So I very poorly draw it out there. It's almost like you have a doorway. 
and then you see the another wall there so um definitely see stuff going on over there as well so this is definitely an area and i think it just shows how rich the pastures of wales was in the medieval period and why people wanted this area on their side and Bangor Museum actually worked on this as well. Bangor University did, and definitely um, a lot of universities nearby. But they were able to find the buried features, so without having to dig holes, like I said, with the open field system. This was a mag to, to meter, which was allowing them to survey the site. So I think it's important to survey the site before you actually commit to digging, because it gives you further evidence that you are actually right in what you're saying. Um, but this was definitely a small village. This isn't something that was very um, big. And they talk about this being the Dark Ages, but I think the way that this was settled, uh, set up, the fact that we still see some of the foundations there, I don't think it was the, the Dark Ages. People knew what they were doing. They just didn't feel the need to document it in such a great detail. Um, and it, it shows that this land now is just flat, featureless lands but if you dig a little deeper you do find these seven um buildings maybe possibly more but it is a whole village they're able to find so you do see uh like i said Bangor university and Kadu working on here it was two week excavation um and they were able to find um some of the houses buried in sand dunes as well um nearby so they were able to see how these um houses and i think the problem that we have with sand dunes in terms of medieval houses, um, is that the, the, these sand dunes can be a cause of why they're abandoned. One thing that we always see with medieval settlements is how they've been abandoned. And a lot of people talk about plague. A lot of people talk about um, lack of money. Um, and I think sometimes there isn't all the options considered especially when it comes to settlements near sand. So there is one nearby that's connected to the sand and it was due to a build of the sand why this settlement was built uh, abandoned. And we see that with Rossilly. Um, so it was Glamorgan Glen to Archaeological Trust that was able to work on this as well. They were able to provide radiocarbon data to these houses to be around by the 7th of 8th century. They were able to see that these houses were quite large. And... There was no pottery or coins that were being found at this time. So unfortunately, it's just the buildings. It would be amazing if they were able to find out more information as time goes on. And um, someone has said that because we can't find many coins or pottery, maybe this was just a very secluded settlement. It was isolated from everyone else. And it was only after the Vikings that we start to see more of a connection with everyone else. So uh, it's something that people have debated, something that we can look into further at another time. So I want to take us to uh, St. Ishmael's now. Um, this is something that I actually did like looking into um, for my dissertation. And you do see a lot of information here um, showing fish traps that are still found in the water from the medieval period. So they're showing that they're actually um, catching a lot of fish here in this area. And you see how this is a settlement that has really fascinated people over time. Again, sand dunes being part of the issue of why they're um, slowly going. And I think something that really has taken people um, by a storm is that this is this is in Pembrokeshire as well, if you have a look on any of the maps that look on it. But it was the 12th century settlement that has a lot of archaeology available to us. So, there's, like I said, there's evidence of fishing here. We see documents of this being um, fishing happening on here. Um, there's a lack of historical references in terms of the site. So we see a lot of historical references in terms of trade, but not the site itself. But it was David Archaeology Online that was able to pro provide a very interesting report on the site um, that you can read for free. And some of these images is something that I've taken from them. And I think it was allowing people to actually 
feel connected um, further by, because they were able to uh, take on some locals from the area to actually look at the archaeology. But it was things like this, it was puzzling historians, and I think historians are always going to be puzzled when it comes to archaeology because they focus too much on documentary sources. Documentary sources don't always give the full picture, and then a town will come up that's not mentioned, for example, in a doomsday book or not mentioned in any other uh, documents, and you just think, well, they don't have to. They might not be a town of us for that. Um, but you see how this is a town where we see things such as buildings. Um, one of my favourite things of the buildings is a step, which is the bottom image, which is this one here. So there's a step that goes into someone's house. You can imagine the door frame being here. Um, and the step is just going across there, and you can even see the cobbled flooring. Um, David Archaeology Online actually does provide a very good source to read um, for free. If you just type in David Archaeology St Ishmael's, you definitely see um, some fast, fantastic discussions on all of this. But it, it just shows you how um, I think we're in the early stages of looking at settlements and how how they're actually um, how they're actually fitting into place with the historical sources. And I think one thing that I always say about the historical sources is just quite frustrating sometimes um, because they don't tell us the full picture. And I think sometimes people rely on them a little bit too much. But it was quite recently that they started excavating here, um, something that has taken people's interest that we do see in a half here. So uh, this like little... Um, thing you see the burning and um, this was something that was poking out of the ground something they felt that they needed to actually um ensure that they kept on top um but david archaeology was able to say that there was um a church that was found there nearby um which was further added on and um, there's definitely um a chancel arch was added and um, but there has been added on throughout time especially from the 18th to the early 19th century um, and you definitely see how there's even um, a site analysis of the site. People actually go into great detail of what they see of all this and how they're able to see how it's actually uh, Welsh wars that is actually helping find quite a lot of these things because they're digging and they come across these medieval structures and they're thinking, oh, we better get archaeologists involved. But this is an area that you see lots of evidence in terms of trade with the fisheries. Um, it is along that trade route from Bristol to um, through South Wales to Ireland and vice versa. And I think this was something that was an important trade area for Wales. So it seems that it is a well, very wealthy area and a lot to, to, to actually discuss, but it's actually um, getting someone to actually pinpoint it all together and round it all up rather than just saying, here's the finds and here's what we're going to do. Um, so then we get to this area as well. Um, so you do see the remains of this settlement around here um, in this area. Um, it was excavations were being done in the 1960s here, um, but it was it's a deserted village. They think it's of medieval date. The only reason why they're not 100% sure is because um, they're, they're, they're still not finding evidence that is datable so such as pottery but they're saying from the structure that they're finding they definitely think this is something of of medieval and will crick um it appears to be in a 12th century um deanery list of the book of landeth um meaning that waste or un, or uncultivated hills so i think he's referring to this wooded hill that they have down by here um, and so there's even thought to be an Iron Age fort, which is nearby down, um, north of the village as well, so it's further on up, which you definitely see, and there's definitely a structure that's further on down here. Um, they have found earthworks, they have found some structural evidence and platforms, but there's no datable material. And this is in Newport. And I think it does make sense that there would be a settlement here in Newport because it's quite close to uh, Mega, which we um, see this Mega um, pill um, 
shipwreck, which I've talked about, you definitely see the Newport shipwreck. Um, there is evidence of a pottery industry here. There is evidence of farming here. And I think there would be evidence of a settlement in a village here as well, because this is why trade is going on so um, smoothly in this area. Um, and I think you definitely see one clear um, earthwork, which is like a little square here. Oh, gosh, that's an awful square. Um, but you can see how this also interacts. And it seems like a lot of these sites, we know a lot of information. But this information doesn't take us far. It's found in the archaeology that is, that is a key with these sites and something that people press for. Um, but there is talk of this area being something that would have been important, possibly, but is finding the important parts, the important features of this town to actually show us um, further what is being represented here and what we can tell further from people's lives. Um, so if I get off the pen a minute. Um, so this one's just in Newport. It's just a little lesser known one. But if you know where St Mary's Church is in Well Creek, then it's just literally on the side of that you can find more information um, online as well. When you have a look on satellite Im imagery, you can definitely see how there's clear earthworks. I'm not sure what it would look like standing there because there's been some settlements that I've been to and it just seems completely different when you're on the ground and when you're looking on top. So um, something that I just want to uh, pinpoint towards, um, this is Trelec, this is something that we are doing excavations at with uh, Carl, um, and the site at the bottom is where we're doing um, excavations and we're finding a wall that's going out from it, so it could possibly change the way that this has been built, but there's been lots of coins found in Trelec and Lots of evidence in terms of leather shoes, in terms of um, pottery. The pottery is quite dis um, distinctive, it's green glaze. It's got this beautiful um, design on the front of it. And I think it just further shows to us how this is a very rich town um, of Wales. And I think a lot of people such as um, William Rees, who writes about the martial lords in South Wales, he says this isn't a Welsh town. This is um, a Norman town and um, it helped develop them in a way because you're seeing this rich archaeological evidence. Like I said, there's a lot of um, evidence in terms of pottery, this green glazed pottery. A lot of um, pottery is thought to come from Ham Green, which is in um, Bristol as well. But this leather shoe they found there, they found coinages and plant pots um, buckles and um, this show that the bottom this was um, a manor house and something that people have been used to uh, focus on in terms of looking at the characteristic of manor houses and what they compare to each other can we find out more information from comparing them there is a lot of coins that were found on sites such as um uh the coins are thought to be from edward I is a penny from 1302 to 1303 and then you have um island edward the fourth silver half groat um 1461 to 1483 so you see that there's a long occupation at this manor house and how this was very important um and a lot of people have talked about this you even have the bristol and avon um archaeological societies have talked about this and how they're able to connect that with Bristol. Like I said, hand green pottery is thought to be one of the important things here as well. There's one at uh, 398 um, houses that are thought to be here, um, but 1,288 um, have, have long been a mystery. So this is thought to be a big market town. But what we're seeing at the top, top here so if I get rid of the pen, um, here is um, evidence of the castle that was in the area, this Mott and Bailey that they had going on. Mm -hmm. um, definitely very impressive and something that's very um, infamous. It's called the Tum Terrat, which is situated in the ground, grounds of Course Farm in the southwest of the church. So it dates back to the Norman times. Um, like I said, it's a small Mott and Bailey. It would have had a surrounding ditch around it. Again, defence, and I think it just further shows us how this is an area that was 
further trying to uh, solidify that Norman power along the border, but also provide some income and rich, you know, some rich, um, rich trade coming from it. There is wells that have been found throughout the site. Um, and this is a site that has seen a lot of archaeology being abandoned and just forgotten about because a lot of people um, have found no time for it. But you definitely see how the decline of prosperity of um, started with the Welsh attacks in the 1296 AD, where um, some of the plots were destroyed. And then you see the Black Death, like I said, in 1369. That brought more rivalry with the Welsh princes and the English throne. And then in 1400 AD, you have Owen Glyndor having a rebellion here. So this is a town, I think, that is fought over quite often because people understood that this was a stronghold and was able to uh, allow them to solidify power. And you definitely see how this was abandoned, this area, right up until the Tudor period. And this... Uh, Temp uh, terror as well, um, just showed how people were able to have defence. What we talked about last week, um, with castles, how defence was important with these moss and baileys, because they were able to intimidate people. And I think this was the purpose of this castle. Um, but it has seen a lot of uh, revolts and rebellions, and something that we see, they knew that there was coming. Um, but it's just a shame that nothing's there. I think this would have been um, wooden as well, the fact that we have lack of evidence, but we do have the mound that's still there. So this is a fantastic area, especially what's being found. And like I said, we're doing excavations there and we're finding pottery from all over the place, um, especially in terms of um, Europe and um, a lot of pottery from there. So I think it just shows that this is a very rich area that benefited from um, a lot of the conflict that's going on because people are able to uh, connect. Anyway, let's go on from here. Um, so we have cotton. This is something that we saw in York. Um, so the church is on the bottom. You can see it here. And we did go here with the York trip. Um, you can see how this, where the settlement would have been. You see these... Uh, very bendy roads throughout all of it. Um, further little plots where people would have lived. Um, again, something that hasn't had a lot of excavation on it. Um, people have had some e information of excavations here, um, but they haven't been extensive. And I think that's the frustrating part because we still don't understand what's going on here entirely. And this village is thought to decline after the plague. We see that with quite a lot of villages. Um, and this is something that has really frustrated people because they want to know about this area. They want to know more, but this church is actually quite fascinating because it shows how this is um, a community that was able to stick around right up until the Victorian period. So even though we see this declining from around about 400 uh, families living here, and then it slowly moved down to about 100, and then it moved down to four, and then it was just one individual living here. And you just see how over time, this was just something that people moved away from um, because of the, how urban things have become, how um, people were no longer living this rural life. And it's, like I said, there was two residents who were surviving here right up until the 1900s. It just slowly went into decline. And I think this is just the people who just didn't want to move away. But when you look at this parish, you start to see how um, rich it was. Um, because this was something that we see evidence of, uh, of the population lowering because of urbanisation. But in the Doomsday Book, you see that this is written as Cotton. Um, not cotton. And in 1086, um, the Archbishop of York was also a tenant in chief to uh, King William I, who held this area as well. So again, this is further important. But this church, the Church of Holy Trinity, was rebuilt in 1818 and again in 1890. But this was previously um, an Anglo Scandinavian medieval village that was deserted. So this structure would have slowly been introduced over time afterwards. Um, and you definitely see how this 
is a, a parish church at Langtop, which is an area nearby. So when they started to depopulate, people went over to Langtop and Langtop ended up taking over this area. Um, but this had a population where there was a farmer on the area and they think that one of the last individuals living here was the farmer. But um, this was built as... Um, something that was very important for people to live off the land to further trade and further have connections and you definitely see how um, a medieval town was set up this is also like a nucleated um village but again this isn't something that's really in your face you can see how there was very little connection to this area especially because they've just left it so if you do go there there is lots of humps and bumps in the ground you see that magnificent church but sadly um, we don't know much about it because people haven't dug this up. So I'm just showing you today all the settlements that haven't really been excavated to it. Well, Trelec has, but in a very fine detail, some of these ones and how we're definitely seeing a change in all of this. So um, we have an understanding from these settlements, even if we haven't excavated them that much, it's still in its early days. And these settlements have come to light. It's helped widen the knowledge of how they're structured, how the industry develops, how this way of life for the villagers go on, how they have superstitions, like in Everton, where they're burying the dagger, how there's many opportunities to be many breakthroughs of knowledge. And however, funding is an issue, I think, for some of these places, because it's having funding to actually excavate and find out more of what's going on. But... It's nice to actually map them out. One thing that I think is very interesting site that many of you might be interested in, if you type in Doomsday Book online, you have um, a free online source that is written, uh, it was made by um, a professor who you can write, basically what I've been doing is that I've been going on the map version and then I click on... Um, for example, fisheries, and it comes up with all the fisheries that have been noted in the Doomsday Book. Um, Wales is quite sparse. England's very well documented, but it gives you evidence. So if I say um, fisheries and then it come up with a site in um, England, then it would give me the page of the Doomsday Book, the exact part of the Doomsday Book and what is telling you how much income they're having, how many people live there, the Lordship. And I think that's another way that you can actually try and find these settlements and find the pinpoints of trade. Again, further tells us more. So it's something that to definitely keep an eye out. Like I said, next week, we will be looking at um, Italy. Um, and just looking at this very uh, retrospective look of Italy, how the archaeology has developed and changed throughout time um, and how different uh, parts of the world's events going on at the time has affected um, Italian archaeology. It's something that I can't wait for us to get stuck into. So I'll stop sharing now and I'll ask questions. So is there anything that you'd like to ask um, Richard? Richard, you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, anyway. interesting. Yeah, no, thank you, Richard. Um, hopefully we can find some more um, little settlements as well throughout time, but um, throughout time, throughout the world. Yeah. Um, but Italy will be something that I think would be quite interesting to get deep into. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you, Richard. Um, Beth, anything that you'd like to ask or add? No, I, I really enjoyed that, and thanks for the info about searching for the Doomsday Book as well. And uh, yeah, search on that. I really look forward to that. Yeah, and it's 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 a very handy source. Something that I found by accident, but. If you're, I'm not very good sometimes with the old English and um, just reading that. So sometimes if you just type in what you want, it just comes up very easy. And then you can see, it helps you actually read that type of uh, writing as well, because you start to compare them. Like I said, it comes up with the exact bit. So um, yeah, definitely something to explore. Um, very easy to navigate as well. So uh, thank you. Um, and anything that you'd like to ask or add? Well, I'm sorry I missed the first beginning. I, I couldn't get online. Oh, we were missing you, Anne. I forgot, and oh. then I couldn't get online. 
<laughs> I couldn't get in, but uh, no. It I, is recorded, I, Anne. It's great that, you know, there are bits of information that they're starting to get bits of information. Yeah. Um, maps and and manuscripts and things like that you know and and now archaeology of, yeah um, you know our pre uh med well early medieval then you know and uh as uh, i'll have a look at it after <laughs> i'll have okay. a look at the beginning after <laughs> it's all right Anne. it's all right and um, yeah i'll see you tomorrow as Is well anyway there? Pat's yeah, done. Pat, she's uh, on holiday um, yeah, and it seems like she's having a lovely time. Pat, is there anything you'd like to ask or add? Yes. You said about St. Ishmael's? Yes. And you said it was in Pembroke. Yes. Uh, whereabouts in Pembroke? Um, so um, if I uh, get it up on my screen now, hang on. Ooh, do, 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 do. Coast, isn't it? It's, yeah, it is along the coast. It's, it's very nice. I think it's very well situated uh, area, especially when you look at it in terms of trade. But if I get a, um, it on on here, and then I'll show you, I'll share screen so I can show you exactly. So if my laptop wants to hurry up, <laughs> it's the technology. It just doesn't work well with me. Oh, we'll press this button. Oh, I've got it. I've got it working. Um, if I just put up uh, slowly trying to get it to uh, it's come up with a picture of a squirrel so that's lovely um, <laughs> so hang on it is, I don't know why it takes so long mm. it's almost like it just tries to get on my nerves on purpose um, yeah, so not yeah, far from <laughs> so share screen so here, here we are. Um, so it's around about where that red mark is, is around about this area here. And um, you see evidence of the fish traps happening. Yeah, um, it's, it's around Dale. It's near, near Yeah, Dale. so if I zoom out, it's near oh, Milford okay, Haven. Then. Yeah, so uh, if I zoom Where are you, Pat? St. David. <laughs> yeah, St. David, yeah. yeah. So... It's what I like to call um, the part of uh, Wales that is his nose, if that makes sense. So I like to look at Wales and it looks a little bit like a pig, mm. a pig's head. <laughs> um, so it's right by where that pinpoint is. Um, bring it closer again. Closer, closer. Oh, oh you, if, well, you wouldn't have to go the coast way. You could just come down and, you know, Yeah. Come down. It's a it's a bit B &B farther, there. I suppose. Yeah, so it is here. St. Right. Ishmael's where. Um, but it's, it's a lovely uh, little area. Oh, Milford, Milford What's the Haven. water there? Is that Milford Haven? Yeah. Yes. Okay, gotcha. I know that's yeah. cool. Um, oh, gosh, I forgot how to stop share. Sometimes I'm <laughs> fireworks outside. I'm thinking, gosh, it's, it's, it's almost <laughs> like it's New Year's Eve. Well, the other thing I was oh, in was the... Um, um, of field systems. I always yes. think they're very interesting. Now, where did you say there were field systems showing? Was that? Um, in, yeah. In yes, it was Angle C. So okay. um uh do you want me to show that again to you, Pat? Um they're quite narrow, narrow strips of land. So oh, behind yeah. Or else or something like yeah. That. Uh, oh, I don't know why my laptop's gone a little bit funny at the moment. I think he's having a little bit of a, a moment. So uh, hang on a minute. <laughs> field systems so yeah it's, it's near Anglesey so uh, Anglesey is something that is uh, quite interesting to actually look at because you see a lot of trade going on here like I said in terms of um, in terms of uh, the, the Vikings yeah, connecting here and yeah. slave trade but you definitely see how Anglesey is providing a lot of evidence as well I think that shows a village is quite quiet to themselves but also might have a small amount of trade mm, um, yeah. so yeah, is there anything else you'd like to ask, Pat? Not that it. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, Thank you. I'll see some of you okay. tomorrow, and I'll uh, see uh, the, the rest of you next week. So take okay. care. Okay. Right. Bye-bye. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. I think I'll Bye. see you tomorrow. You